Are we good to go? Okay. Yeah. So, hello, and welcome to my second talk today. Uh, with my previous talk, I had the slot before the lunch, so I was preventing everyone from going to lunch. Now I have the problem that every one of you had lunch, I suppose, and uh, uh, heading into the uh, digestion coma now. Uh, to prevent that, I've decided to do my talk completely in all caps. No, I won't. Um, just a short blurb about myself. Uh, my name is Jochen Lillich, I'm from Germany. And um, I've been a sysadmin uh, all, my um, all my professional life. Discovered Linux in 1993. Uh, started doing sysadmin work, then went into IT training, mainly open source training, uh, training for system administrators, which brought me to WebDE, uh, one of the biggest web portals in Germany. Um, I first did a few months of IT training there and then was offered a position as IT trainer, um, where I started uh, building a, my own team. Uh, for the first two months I was the team and uh, then I started hiring additional people and we are, were um, uh, running the billing system for example and other uh, things. We, uh, we uh, built the uh, data warehouse system and uh, uh, eventually were acquired by One and One where I became um, head of IT core services, uh, a department of three teams with uh, about 10 admins each. And we were providing the complete IT uh, department with uh, central services like the backup system for uh, 50,000 servers. Um, we were doing um, central tools like uh, software deployment um, and uh, running some security intensive uh, subsystems. In 2009, I decided to start another business, and I founded Frysteel IT, which is a uh, IT shop basically doing ops for devs. Uh, we are targeting developers and uh, taking care of all things IT, so uh, developers can focus on their projects, and uh, it's our task to get up at night and replace hard disks or restart some Apache servers. Uh, we are at Frysteel on Twitter, and uh, our main product is Drupal Concept, which is a platform as a service that's completely optimized for Drupal. Um, we started with Drupal Concept in 2010 at the uh, Drupal Developer Days in Munich, and since then have been growing our hosting infrastructure and growing our customer base all over U Europe. Um, Drupal Concept follows the same concept, uh, we provide and manage the complete IT infrastructure and our customers can focus on building awesome websites. In all those years, I've discovered that doing DevOps is hard. And if you look for the problems, there are many. First, DevOps is a huge topic. It's a broad horizon. Um, doing everything from the idea of an application of a product, uh, getting it into production and keep it up is not only a huge time uh, space, but also uh, in includes many, many tasks. Uh, you have developers and you have admins and then you can go uh, into more detail and say, okay, there are database admins, there are storage admins, there are system admins, and so on. So all these people have their own problems, their own advantages and weaknesses, and uh, you'll see that when you're doing a project that encompasses all of them. There are many principles, there are many internal or external people you do work for. And of course, uh, each project they are doing is the most important and uh, f 
for each project you are expected to give it the highest priority. Each of these projects is isolated, so it's uh, competing um, uh, for resources you have in your DevOps team, um, and of course you never have enough people. Uh, you never have the right people with enough time to do all those tasks within those projects. And especially in the ops part of DevOps, you also have a lot of interruptions. There's always an incident, there's always an outage that prevents you from doing the work you uh, planned to do or you were supposed to do. Uh, and with project, de project deadlines um, looming, you get always into trouble if there is an outage that uh, takes you more than a few minutes to resolve. So, in consequence, there's a lot of load from time to time, most of the times more than you'd like to have, and there are also times where you don't have uh, much load, for example, between projects, or uh, during those times in a project when, for example, there's more development to do than system administration. It's hard to keep an overview over the different tasks that are to be, to be done in a DevOps team. Who does what? Who does what as a next step? Is a question uh, that is most of the times hard to answer. That causes your planning to be quite poor. Uh, it's hard to estimate how long it will take you to complete a certain task if you always have to take into account that there could be an outage around the corner. So if you say, okay, it'll take me two days to finish that and a database cluster goes down or another catastrophe is happening, um, then you won't be able to reach this, this goal. If you say, okay, it probably will, will uh, take me two uh, days, but I'll take into account that there may be outages, and so you say, oh, it'll take me three or four days. Uh, you may be able to reach that goal before your estimated time, but uh, as soon as you tell the project manager, uh, he'll learn a lesson from that and simply uh, take half of the numbers you give him as a project estimation. In turn, that generates dissatisfaction on all sides and mistrust. He told me he'll uh, be able to finish that in four days. Well, did he take into account that there will, will be interruptions, so I plan three days and get to my project goal earlier? Or should I plan additional days to, to have uh, space for the unplanned things? And there's uh, a growing mistrust into all that's uh, said inside the project context. The more mistrust you, uh, you have, the more external influence there will be, by example, from higher management, and uh, there will be uh, people quite uh, unhappy with that job. There are methods to deal with those challenges. And one method that's gaining ground in the IT space and especially in DevOps is Kanban. So uh, that's what this talk will be about. Kanban is a term that was coined at the half of the last century, about 1947, by Taiji Ono, uh, who worked at Toyota in uh, organizing the production. He took goals of the lean manufacturing movement, especially the goals to shorten lead time, to increase productivity, and to create satisfaction and trust at all levels. He chose Kanban as a method, and uh, Kanban is a uh, uh, built from two Japanese syllables with can meaning signal and ban means, meaning card uh, because basically he took signal cards uh, to mark stations in the production line 
that were ready to receive uh, another part of a product. What you don't want in, to, in a production line is, for example, a worker dropping her screwdriver and products start piling up before his or her station. So they used signal cards that signaled to the previous station, okay, I'm ready to receive another part uh, and to work on that. And until that uh, signal card wasn't there, uh, there were no products coming in. So Kanban relies on visualization. You can tell at all times which station is prepared to do another step of the work. And it's based on a pull principle. It's not that we are pushing work and it will be eventually done. Uh, it's that we are pulling work into as soon as we have the capacity to work on it. There's an interesting uh, use of a pull principle in real world. And that's the Imperial Gardens in Tokyo, in Japan. It's a beautiful place and you can enter it free of charge. But at the entrance, you will be handed an admission ticket. All it contains is that it asks, is a text asking you re to return that ticket when you leave the gardens. You don't pay for admission, so what's the use of this card? Well, the thing is, people can only enter the gardens as long as there are still cards to hand out. If all cards are uh, on the way in the gardens, you won't be allowed to enter. Not until uh, cards are left at the exits and brought back to the entrances, there will be the possibility of entering the garden. And that way, uh, they keep population in the gardens uh, on a level that's um, pleasing to all the visitors. That's a pull principle. Take more in as long as you have the capacity to do so. And stop taking more work in our context in uh, if there's not any more to, do, to, to spread. The Kanban method was um, built as an adaptation of that principle in IT. Uh, it's mostly uh, David Anderson who uh, started using Kanban as a, as a project management method in IT in um, about 2007. And these are the core attributes the Kanban method uses to have more control over the processes in our uh, workflows. First, visualize the order flow. Make visible where uh, work goes on, hopefully as planned, and where work stops. So you can see where to focus on to prevent problems from getting worse. The second one I think is the most important, limit work in progress. Stop piling up tasks. Have a limited list of tasks that are worked on per person or per team and focus on, that, on these tasks, get them out of the way as soon as possible and then get more, pull in more work. This makes it possible to measure and control how work is flowing through our teams and to our people. You can measure how long it takes a task from getting into the team, being worked on, and get, uh, getting finished and uh, being passed on. Define the rules explicitly. So define, for example, what it means that a task is finished. How can we see that the task is finished? How can an individual person determine if the task is finished? Write that down, distribute that rule, and have people understand how work 
flows from one station to another. Building feedback loops. So you see early um, when problems arise and deal with them. And then use models, use science for improvement. Another um, word that's uh, connected to Kanban is Kaizen, which means continuous improvement. So Kanban is a kind of agile way of dealing with workflows, but it's very uh, simple to implement and uh, it's uh, creating results very quickly. How does that work in practice? First, there's visualization. I apologize for the non-translated title here. Um, so visualization is done with a Kanban board. This can be a physical board, like a pin board or a, a whiteboard. And of course, there are also digital equivalents you can use. These boards are divided into columns, and those columns um, symbolize the different steps a product or a task or an order goes through. You start with a backlog where you decide which are the next steps, which are the next tasks we have to work on. And then you have columns. You determine yourself what these columns contain. For example, it could be the, f uh, the first real stage could be a planning stage. So you take a task out of the backlog into the planning stage do your planning, and then you go into development. Finally, you go into delivery, and a task now is in production. Every task goes from left to right over that board. So for example, there could be a task C in the backlog, still not being worked on, a task B in the planning phase, a task A could be uh, in the development phase. Here we could um, now go on to work on task A and uh, move it on to delivery. Sometimes it's uh, a good step to uh, divide a column. For example, if a a task like A is uh, finished with developing, but uh, not quite ready to um, be delivered. You can uh, half that and say, okay, there's a um, task A is being worked on, or task A is finished and ready for delivery, and waiting for the delivery team, for example, or for the person um, doing the delivery to pull it into their column. And now it's important to add another uh, attribute to the columns, which is the work in progress. For example, we could say, um, at all times, there shouldn't be more than two tasks in the planning stage. If we already have two tasks in the planning column, we won't pull another one from the backlog. Development could be two as well. and. Delivery, for example, if it's only one person doing that, uh, they should focus on one task, so we limit the work in progress in the delivery stage to one. That's basically the way you do uh, visualization of uh, tasks and their stages they are in. It's easy to set up such a Kanban board. Uh, you can use a physical board, as I already said. You can use an Excel table, uh, there are web-based um, Kanban tools on the internet, um, it's your choice. If you go into more detail, uh, we could differentiate different order types. Such an order could be a requirement, a feature that has to be developed and uh, go, go productive, a user story, a change request on, for, for the production environment, a production defect, maintenance work, um, everything you are working on should go onto the Kanban board. And 
by the, uh, for example, by using uh, cards of different colors, you could uh, um, mark the different order types. Tasks also differ in uh, regards of time. So we could say, okay, there's some kind of standard task that's simply being worked on and it's finished when it's finished. There could be also a deadline connected to the task uh, that tells us, okay, we are uh, two days away from the deadline, we should um, start working on that, or uh, there's um, still a few weeks until that ha thing has to be finished so we can put it on the back burner. There can be a wake, um, uh, a wake deadline connected with it, meaning, uh, well, do it as soon as you have time. Um, there are, for example, some maintenance things that uh, aren't connected to any deadline. So you can say, okay, these are low priority tasks. And on the other side of the scale, there could be urgent tasks that have to be worked on immediately. And these expedited ta tasks could be even um, uh, as urgent as um, to break the work in progress limit. If there is a, a real outage, for example, you can say, okay, tasks marked as urgent, don't care about work in progress limits. Everything has to step back and uh, the, the task, the outage has to be solved first. These should be total exceptions, though. Uh, because as soon as your project managers uh, see that uh, work in progress limits can be broken, they try and do that. And they shouldn't do that. It'll break the whole method and all the visualization will be useless without adhering to those work in progress limits. limits. Okay, that's the basics. Now, how do we get tasks into the backlog? You should take into account different uh, attributes of the tasks to decide, to decide which tasks to take into the backlog. Um, in other agile metho methods, such as uh, Scrum, there's, a, um, there's put much effort into sizing uh, a task, into determining how much effort is connected with the task. There are methods like planning, planning poker and other things. Um, um, Kanban doesn't use uh, such elaborate methods because um, in DevOps, most of the time, it's very, very hard to determine real effort. Since many tasks uh, um, have to be worked on by very different people, you'd have to get to the table the DBA, the system administrator, um, some kind of storage administrator, and a uh, networking expert, and other people, and the cost of getting all those people into meetings, which they do very reluctantly, I guess, um, is, is very, very high, and to be honest, not worth the effort. There are far more efficient methods. Uh, for example, the one, okay, dear project managers, we have two open slots in the backlog, which one of you has the biggest budget? And do a weighted round robin by budget size. That's quite easy, doesn't involve many people, and uh, you get the tasks onto the board quite quickly, and what the, your project managers will see is that tasks get off the board quite quickly. So uh, uh, it's, it's not very reasonable to put much effort into uh, effort sizing, uh, it's far more uh, efficient to get those tasks being worked on. The backlog should be filled regularly and a frequency of once a week uh, is, is uh, most of the times a very good frequency. Then tasks 
have to be worked on and finally delivered. Delivery should be regularly as well because it creates trust. If you can um, show finished tasks, for example, also every week, your project managers will gain trust in your estimations, gain trust into the method, and um, so uh, your support will be getting stronger by support by management, support by project management and other sides. What's important and uh, uh, an important difference to Scrum, there is no time boxing. A task is finished when it's finished. If you're finishing it early, good, get to the next task. If it takes longer than you estimated, uh, well, get it done. And uh, especially in more mature organizations, you can do ad hoc delivery, so it's really finished when it's finished. Uh, as soon as a task reaches the done column to the right, um, you can signal to your project managers, okay, there's uh, another task done, so we can um, get on with our work. The highest form of that is called continuous deployment, so delivery um, takes place all the time. Equally to, for example, Scrum, there's also a stand-up meeting where the people involved with the tasks, that's the DevOps team or teams and the project managers, convene daily and do short exchanges how things are. And the goal of these stand-up meetings is process improvement. So everyone is invited to show and tell where are we uh, getting on well and where are the problems. Most of the time these problems can be seen on the Kanban board as well and uh, I'll show you an example shortly. There's also an operations review uh, in some bigger distances uh, that also involves management to get improvements all over the place. I've done a few comparisons already, so um, let's look at these a bit more detailed. Kanban, as every agile method, is far superior to the old waterfall um, method of doing projects, where uh, there's first a big planning phase, then uh, a big development phase, and then the big bang release and uh, a party uh, afterwards. I think uh, I don't have to get more into that and how that is a really inefficient way of doing projects. Of course, uh, in comparison with another agile method is more interesting and Kanban uh, stands quite well there. There are no fixed roles, for example, so you don't have uh, someone like a project owner and uh, which is quite hard to pinpoint. Who is the product owner of your postfix cluster, for example? Um, and uh, everyone is involved, but they, they don't get fixed role names. An important difference also is uh, there are no uh, limits to specialization, so your database administrator can be a database administrator and stay a database administrator. Um, iterations are only optional, so you gain quite a lot of uh, flexibility here. There's also no time boxing, as I already said. And planning and delivery are independent from each other, which uh, even increases the flexibility of the Kanban method. Your central metric is lead time. So how long does it take you to finish a task? New orders can come in at every time. You don't need special uh, meetings to do that. For example, if you're using a digital Kanban board, uh, tasks can be uh, added at every time. The order size is not limited, and as I already told you, estimations are not mandatory. I've ta talked a lot about visualization, so I'm going to visualize how the Kanban method works in practice. And I'd like to take you with me on a day in Kanban land. That's our Kanban board, and that's the people who are involved. In red, we have the product, or the project manager. In blue, we have the developers, 
and in green, of course, the operations guys. And they start with using Kanban as a method to organize. You also see the work in progress limits, two planning tasks, two development tasks, and one delivery task at all times. Let's start with the project manager deciding what tasks are the first ones to get out of the backlog jail. He chooses A and B, which reaches uh, where the planned column now reaches its work in progress limit. Otherwise, I think he would, be, uh, he would have added C and D as well. Now the pull principle starts and uh, there are two teams of developers, one working on project A, one on task B. With A and B out of the planning column, our project manager is quite happy that he now finally can add C and D to the planning column. Work goes on, and our happy project manager thinks he'll need also J, K, and L in the backlog. So he adds these. Now A is finished and goes into the delivery column. And the team that has finished A can now pull C from the planning column into the development phase. B already gets finished, but they can't get it out of the development column because the delivery column already is um, full with the ops guys working on A. So B just goes to the waiting part of the de development column. That B is waiting for delivery doesn't mean there's now place for a third project in development. Uh, the development column still is full. And now the shit hits the fan. There's a problem in delivery. can't be pulled into development, although B is finished, because there are two green cards in the de development um, column and the work in progress limit there is two. The project manager still doesn't know about the problems on the right side, so he decides that K is urgent and uh, it's going to be next, not a problem. Now. The de developers realize that uh, they are blocked. And you could ask, well, OK, so Kanban is a, is a method of preventing people from doing their work. No, it isn't. It just focuses all people on the problems in the workflow. So the developers, instead of being able to pull K or D, they go over to their colleagues and say, OK, how can we help you? We have free capacity. How can we use that capacity to get things moving again? There's a problem with the slide. Um, the project manager uh, was asking, uh, can you work on K or D, please? And uh, the developers have to say no. Um, 
we'll, we'll start working on that as soon as, as we have solved the problem with A, because still the work in progress limit uh, in development and delivery prevents us from going on. There's a problem, and we first have to solve that problem. As I said, stop piling up. Now, the other developers can also go and come to the rescue, while the project manager, of course, thinks of his own things. Now also the capacity of the second de development team can be put to uh, gain more results, because uh, obviously this problem has a happens a lot with uh, delivery breaking, and maybe it's good to invest some time into doing some uh, test development to prevent those problems uh, in the first place. Now even the project manager comes and offers help. And somewhat later, we have progress. A finally made it into production as the DLC. K has gone through the development and is delivered at the moment. The developers already have D ready for delivery and are working on G and F. I is in planning. And our project manager does what the project manager does. That's how Kanban works in practice. It limits the work that is being done at a time. It focuses capacity onto those tasks. And it visualizes, especially where we have problems. If a task doesn't move from one column to another, there's a reason. And we should do everything to remove, to resolve that reason. And that's all you need to visualize how work uh, flows through your teams, how work is distributed in your teams, and uh, all you have to do, there's one thing you need to do, get management approval to do work in progress limits. These WIPs are the key that the Kanban method works. And if someone, I, I've seen that, uh, if someone is allowed to uh, break those limits, the whole method uh, uh, breaks, to the, uh, breaks uh, as a whole. That's all you need, and then roll in a whiteboard or use a digital tool and start visualizing your workflow. You had a question? Ah, yes, 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 I stepped over that. Um, yeah, people realized that maybe uh, the developers are more productive than initially thought, so they raise their work in progress limit to three. That's of course a possibility. That's a part of the Kaizen, of the continuous improvement, to realize, okay, um, uh, things are moving more quickly in the development phase than we anticipated, and so let's raise the work in progress limit. Maybe uh, sometimes you'll have to do the opposite, to reduce work in progress, because you see that um, tasks always get stuck. Um, there are always problems with uh, four tasks being worked on concurrently. And uh, so you maybe should lower your work in progress limit, maybe for some time or, or f permanently. So uh, as they did, um, you can, of course, uh, alter, your, uh, alter the rules uh, under which you work. But uh, I can't stress that enough. Uh, don't break the WIPs. I have a few links before we go into the questions. There are, of course, books you can read. The first thing 
to suggest is uh, David Anderson's book, Kanban Successful Evol Evolutionary Change for Your Technology Business, in which he um, explains how he took the production version, um, the manufacturing version of Kanban, uh, and made an IT management method out of it. There's also uh, websites, for example, a mini book that compares Kanban and Scrum. People using the Scrum method in practice have uh, formed the Limited WIP Society, which is a community of Kanban practitioners. Um, and uh, on their website, you'll find a lot of resources on that. And um, for the German readers, there's also websites in German or uh, I'm sure in other languages. And if you're on the road as much as I am, uh, there's also uh, a podcast that uh, deals with Kanban uh, named the ITK podcast. And that's a short introduction into the Kanban method. We've been practicing that in my business for quite some time now in a very small team, but it uh, has enabled us to get an overview over our internal task as well as our uh, client orders and uh, it's so lightweight that uh, um, there's not much overhead to the method. Um, so especially if you are a small team, it's very, very easy and very, very efficient to use the Kanban method. And with that, I'm open for your questions. The question was, uh, if there's a real serious problem getting a task further to the right, can we put it on, on the back burner, basically, and back into the backlog uh, to work on it at some other time? You could. You're free to do that. But uh, it's a bit of cheating, because uh, that's, um, again, uh, hiding the, the problems and um, procrastinating on working on their causes. Uh, I think uh, what's most valuable is that you see, okay, this task has been in that column uh, already last week. Why, di why didn't it move forward? And uh, uh, let's rally together and uh, solve the problem that's preventing it from moving to the next column. Um, of course, uh, if there's a reason to, to uh, deprioritize it, you could, of course, uh, put it back into the backlog, but don't make it a habit. Mm -hmm. What I've experienced is also um, most, there are uh, oftentimes internal tasks, some maintenance things, um, where uh, they are expressed that someone should do that at some time. And um, uh, I'm, for example, quite uh, uh, good in, into thinking of many of such tasks and uh, filling our columns with that. But uh, if you have many of those tasks that get stuck because uh, they don't have uh, enough priority, um, it's good to uh, um, talk about them in the stand-up meeting, for example, and say, okay, that task has been stuck for the fourth time now. Is it really a task that we should do? Or should we just get rid of that? So um, I think that's another way of uh, getting rid of tasks that should be done some time. There are many tasks you can uh, lose altogether without any uh, consequences. Uh, could you give an example? Dependencies which we haven't uh, anticipated before. Mm -hmm. if, if you see that there's a task that's de dependent on another, so it uh, has to wait until the other task uh, is finished or at least has moved, for, has moved on, um, uh, you could, for example, uh, do some kind of prioritization. Um, using, for example, paper cards on a, on a whiteboard, uh, you could uh, 
classify them into different priorities and uh, w first work on the, the ones with higher priority. If you see that a task uh, contains a part that is, uh, has to be done first, uh, maybe you should split that task into two and, first and, 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 and do one first and the other uh, afterwards. Um, that's, that's a thing you should discuss in your stand-up meeting. Uh, if you realize, okay, uh, it's a bit more complicated than we thought, uh, then discuss it with your team what, what to do uh, at that place. Yes, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, if you have tasks that are uh, specialized, for example, is it, good to, uh, is it an, a good idea to move them off onto another board? Yes, it is. For example, if you have uh, persons that have a very special shop description, for example, an IT architect, you, have, you don't have many of these uh, usually, um, or a DBA, your only DBA, um, it, it could be efficient that these people have they, their own boards so they can visualize uh, at which stage is which pro uh, project I am participating in. Uh, most of the times these people are in different uh, projects at the same time and they need to visualize that to uh, keep control on their tasks. So uh, their tasks will show up on different boards then. There are um, also uh, projects that are that big that it's uh, a good idea to split them into hierarchical boards. For example, the project manager could have a rough outline of the project on a board and um, then uh, specialized boards with specialized teams, for example. If you have a huge IT organization, you could be able to, to split uh, this also hierarchical. Moses? I come back to you. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, it's it's a good idea to uh, put all tasks uh, your team is working on onto the board. So if you are working with support tickets, for example, uh, they could have a place there too um, to visualize. Uh, for example, if there are urgent support tickets that require uh, immediate action. And um, so, uh, as I said, there is the possibility of having uh, even urgent uh, tasks that uh, break the work in progress limits because uh, there's, uh, for example, um, if, if there's a, a real um, disaster on the customer side and you need to deal with that first, um, of course, because it's the customer, uh, you could visualize that as well by putting it on the board making it a red card, for example, and prioritizing it uh, over all other tasks. Yeah, that's also a possibility to introduce lanes in, onto your board, which are divided vertically, and uh, you may have a fast lane for special projects. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think uh, that that depends on your organization. Uh, for example, um, as I uh, remember it uh, with uh, one and one there are many, many project managers doing many, many t uh, projects, and that's where the uh, tasks originate. And instead of flooding the IT department with tasks that have to be dealt with in weeks, um, uh, project managers can start with uh, breaking up their projects into different tasks they keep for themselves for the time being and then start taking those tasks uh, one by one and putting them into the backlog. The question was how to deal with people that are not present, that work uh, remotely, for example. 
uh, how do they uh, get access to the Kanban board? There are, of course, different solutions, and uh, the, uh, David Anderson in his book uh, or, uh, actually talks about having a physical board with cards and, um, uh, for example, um, having someone who is responsible to transfer uh, the physical board, which is easily seen walking by, um, into a digital system. They, um, he developed uh, the Kanban method mostly at, um, at his time at Microsoft, and they were using Microsoft, uh, I don't remember the product name, uh, some kind of uh, team organization product of Microsoft to um, visualize their work, but they all, uh, also had a physical Kanban board and someone was responsible to synchronize these. I don't know how efficient that can be. So um, we, for example, prefer to do it all digitally. We are using um, Trello.com, which is a free tool you can get um, uh, at Trello.com. Um, it's basically got these columns. You can add as many columns as you want. And by dragging and dropping, you're moving the cards uh, over this board that you create. And you can create as many boards as you want. So for example, coming back to your question, um, you could do a board for each project where you um, differentiate your tasks. For example, you have one column with your planning tasks, uh, one column with the development tasks, and things like that. And then take tasks from these project boards onto a team board where they go from left to right. And I think you, uh, I've, I've got quite good experience doing that uh, in a completely digital form. Uh, which makes it very easy to integrate people that are not present at your office space. There are proven solutions to do that. Uh, for example, Google Hangouts, Skype chats, things like that. Depends on your um, way of, of, of working. I think uh, that's not uh, a thing that, that Kanban tries to solve. Uh, that's a more general topic you'll have to discuss with your team. Mm -hmm. It is. Uh, that's why we um, got to the place, uh, to, got to a, to a point where we decided to only use one Trello board for the work in progress task that we are working on, divided into uh, columns like like I uh, uh, presented here, and they are um, boards we use for collection, uh, mainly uh, divided by topic or by project. Um, where we don't, we, we use them only as a place to store tasks, not to organize them. Um, as soon as a task is going to be worked on, uh, it moves to the work in progress board, where it moves from left to right in the usual manner. No, we don't. Uh, no. Um, most of the time, uh, it's, uh, it's a good idea to measure the, the speed of uh, the tasks moving over your, your board. You can, for example, um, document when that task uh, got onto the board and uh, maybe do a log of when it moved from column to column. Tools like Trello will do this automatically. And uh, then you could do a um, measurement how quickly tasks move, which will also point you to uh, sources of problems. Uh, when you see that uh, the, there's a column where tasks stay for a lot longer time than in other columns, you could focus uh, on the reasons why that is the case. But uh, I think um, if you structure your tasks small enough, uh, there's uh, a real, a real speed gain um, where tasks won't stay on the board very much, lo uh, very, very long. And uh, that's, that's a uh, thing that makes all people quite happy. It makes the, the, uh, it, uh, the DevOps guys and, and girls um, happy because tasks vanish as soon as they come, uh, as quickly as they come. And um, of course, it makes the project managers happy as well.
Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, you are free to, to structure your columns, for example, and you are, of course, free to, as we uh, talked uh, already about, um, to introduce additional boards, for example, a special board for the DBA. Um, so uh, you could have a placeholder card in the delivery column and uh, signifying that uh, this uh, task is being delivered especially by the DBA at the moment, for example. He's uh, uh, doing, uh, uh, set, setting up table spaces or things like that. And um, so, uh, You just divide the delivery column, for example, um, into different uh, sections. Yeah. Let's start at the. Um, just a moment. Yeah. Here we go. You could, for example, um, divide something like the development column or the delivery column uh, horizontally with horizontal lines where the task is going to uh, DBA work, is going to network uh, things, and you could have different work in progress with these following sections. So, for example, I have uh, two DBAs, but only one network admin, uh, of course, uh, they, the, the WIP of the network admin would be lower than that of the DBAs, for example. Uh, so, so you're visualizing two dimensions, uh, basically. Uh, you see all the tasks that are in de uh, delivery, but you also see where they are in delivery, who delivers them. And that, um, by the way, makes it very easy to answer the question, who is doing what and who is doing what next. Okay, if you have further questions, I'm here all day. Feel free to 